This week's episode of Still Untitled is made possible by the fine folks at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Faculty and students there recently built a robot fish. Why? Because it could lead to a new wave of prosthetics and now we're all hooked. At RIT, the creative team of engineers is on to something that could be life-changing. Learn more about that project at rit.edu slash untitled. Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. And I'm Sarah. Sarah, welcome! Sarah Parkek, space archaeologist, has graced the cave with her presence today. I feel like space archaeologist, you really need to hit that one. Like, that's cool. Space archaeologist! Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and it's good because I'm sitting in the eject seat. So yes. that seems yeah. about right. Exactly. The only, this ejection seat, by the way, has the full survival kit in the seat underneath you. Um, the parachute is fully loaded. The only thing it doesn't have is the rocket in the back to get you out of the plane. But we could add that if we needed to. Amazing. <laughs> it's, it's, we, we usually put the guests in that chair just in case it doesn't work out. Okay, I can go through the. Through so let's exactly. define our terms. What yes. is a space archaeologist? What is a space? Ar so a space archaeologist is someone who uses um, different kinds of remotely sensed data, either taken from satellites or uh, or a laser system that's placed on an airplane. And we use the data, uh, especially different parts of the light spectrum, to discover past civilizations and features like pyramids and cities and ancient water courses. And archaeologists have used this to find tens of thousands of previously unknown archaeological sites around the world so 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 basically you can use satellite imagery and plane imagery to see stuff see the the shadows of the things that used to be there is that is that safe is that a so, yeah so so if you look at sort of cities and how they degrade over time sometimes you know little bits of cities are sticking out and we as tourists today can go to visit them but most um, ancient civilizations or features in them um, they either had the stones robbed away and there's just really nothing left visible on the surface but if you have say a buried stone wall that's underneath a modern field it's going to affect say the vegetation health of the grass or whatever's growing on top of it. So you can use different parts of the light spectrum to look at things like vegetation health differences or different types of soil that may be affected by what's degrading under the ground. And so we make this completely invisible world visible. So sort of think of, think of it like a space-based x-ray to find ancient sites. Okay. And but not a literal x-ray, a lot of inferences and a lot of just guessing and using that evidence. Yeah, so so we use pretty standard off-the-shelf remote sensing software. So it's the same software that you know biologists use to map different parts of the rainforest, or that meteorologists use to look at um, look for look for differences in climate. And in addition, you're crowdsourcing this discovery process. That's yeah. one of the things I find most exciting about this is you're giving civilians a chance to, to, to join in the journey. So yeah, so there are only a couple hundred of us um, space archaeologists around the world. Maybe maybe there's a couple thousand, but you know, you look look at where we've lived over the last, you know, several hundred thousand years. There are millions and millions of archaeological sites out there to discover. And so a couple years ago, um, I started an organization called Global Explorer and it's an online citizen science crowdsourcing platform. Um, and it allows anyone in the world to help look at satellite imagery and find sites. And we've had, I think, about 84, 85,000 people from over wow. 100 wow. countries. And they found almost 30,000 potential archaeological features in Peru alone. And I mean, one of the things you were showing me last time I, I visited the lab in Alabama was that you could easily see from the satellite imagery a site that had already been discovered and looted. And that was the thing is like if there, if there are details, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but if there are details that are visible from the ground, someone has dug in to try and find stuff. And what you're finding is all these really pristine potential sites that are pristine that no one has discovered yet. That's right. So, you know, it's, it's one thing for archaeologists to survey, you know, near a city or maybe they go off a couple hours and, you know, they're off in the middle of nowhere and it, it, it's fine. But sometimes you have to travel for weeks and weeks to get to these remote places. It's just almost impossible to visit them. And in, in some cases, they're completely obscured and hidden beneath the rainforests of Central America. And without this data, uh, you, can't, you can't find them. They're otherwise totally invisible. It's like so, throwing a dart into a bush. Right. Can, <laughs> right. can we get a little bit of like a history lesson? Like before this satellite imagery was available, how did traditionally archaeologists choose what sites to explore and, and, and it, 
and where are those places located relative to where you're finding places now? So, um, so either archaeologists, you know, for the last couple hundred years, they've, you know, they've been using things like the Bible or other written texts. Um, mm. You know, think about Heinrich Schliemann and, and how he found Troy. Um, or, you know, they know um, local people tell them where sites are, but sometimes sites are found completely randomly. Uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, a donkey fell into a shaft and this whole Greco-Roman period cemetery was discovered. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, a lot of things are still found completely by, by chance. But what the satellites allow us to do is really pinpoint exactly where to go. Um, and it's not, it's not even a, a, a new technology, per se. Um, one of the first instances of an archaeologist using remotely sensed data was at, at Stonehenge in 1906. Oh, from wow. A tethered balloon was used to take images of the site. Oh. So, and, and it's actually... Um, archaeologists that inspired the use of um, aerial reconnaissance in World War II. What? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, so in in World War One, um, a lot of um, obviously they were recruiting um, uh, people from from all over Europe to, um, to to fight in the war, and several individuals who were amateur photographers um, were going on re essentially flying in airplanes over different sites in the Middle East, and because they were interested archaeologists, they were taking pictures. They showed them to their commanding officers, and they went, "Wait a minute, you can take pictures." of sites from airplanes, <laughs> <laughs> hmm, this could be interesting. So, um, so archaeology is one of the things that really kicked off, you know, aerial reconnaissance for the military. So, so how much of your time do you spend, you know, looking at pictures and looking at data that's generated by those pictures? And how much do you spend actually going out and, and you know, digging up stuff? So I, I, I wish that like 100% of my time were in the field. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm a professor and, you know, I have to teach my classes and spend a lot of time in meetings. So most of the time I'm, I'm researching, I'm looking things up in the library. And so for every hour or two that I'm looking at satellite imagery, um, that represents probably weeks of research that I've done because we never look at imagery blind. We're doing tons of research about whatever civilization we're, we're examining, previous work in the area, because we just don't want to find a shape. We want to be able to say, right, that's a mid-Dynasty five um, upper middle class tomb. And here's the range of individuals with whom it could be associated. And that's the level of granularity that we wow. can get from wow. remotely sensed data now. Wow, that's amazing. I love that it's from the biggest picture, literally the biggest picture view you could have from the satellite. Then you go, you may go on site, then to the closest, most intimate look. And then there's a temporal aspect because then you're also going back in time. Like you're seeing spots on Earth unlike people have ever seen it. And, and what's amazing, too, is um, it's beginning to be used by other fields aside from archaeology. You know, you look at uh, the, the search for dinosaur bones, mm -hmm. and, of course, that's primarily geology. And if you can find specific chemical signatures in the satellite imagery oh. of strata where there could be dinosaur bones, then that could help um, paleontologists pinpoint where to go and search. Wow. Because oftentimes, as, as we know, those, those things are found randomly as well. Or are there like satellite based spectrographs or are you just look so so um, there are hundreds of different satellites of course that are observing the earth and every satellite is taking a different kind of picture so some satellites are purely um, visual which is which is great I'll think of like a, a Google Earth image it's a visual uh, color image you can zoom in and zoom out but a lot of satellites take uh, pictures in different parts of the light spectrum so the near middle far infrared or thermal infrared and there are even um, hyperspectral cameras that we can use you attach them to um, to airplanes and Instead of getting, say, four, eight, 12, 15 bands within the light spectrum, you can get hundreds of bands. Oh, wow. So wow. geologists can use that data to say, all right, you know, I want this particular, I'm looking for this particular kind of stone in the middle of nowhere because that could help me with prospecting for, say, oil. And mm -hmm. you can get the exact spectral signature of or, the type or of geology. Or you can see that somebody brought stone from one place to another. Right. And that yeah, okay. That's um, fascinating. So one of the things I love about you, Sarah, is that you are such an unabashed nerd for this stuff. Like when we <laughs> get together and we start talking about it, your your eyes light up. Um, and I'm, when I visited your house, I loved it. You said we're like in your living room and your son's running around and you said, 
Would you like to come upstairs and see a real Egyptologist's library? <laughs> <laughs> and it like it literally matched my mental image of what it should look like, right? Like books everywhere, scrolls sticking out of these it's shelves. Like and the just... Venetian Library from the third Indiana Jones movie, <laughs> you know, where where X never marks the spot, but oh, maybe it does this time. But so I'm curious, has there like? I haven't asked you this question, uh, but I'm curious if there's been an object you've held that had, you felt like did transport your consciousness back uh, back in age. I don't know whether it feels like you've been transported or whether you just have a clarity or an understanding, but I'm curious about that. So this happened um, on my first excavation. So this was almost exactly 20 years ago at a site um, about two and a half hours northeast of Cairo. And I was working on a 4,200 year old uh, tomb, part of a cemetery at a site called Mendes. And as I was excavating down, um, I started to come across this pot. And in archaeology, when you find a piece of something, um, your your instinct is to pull it out of the ground, but you have to override that because that could be connected to another thing that could be connected to another thing. So all these pieces started seeming to, to line up, and it was a um, it was a beer jar from the old kingdom, so that that's that's over four thousand years ago, kind of squished flat. So someone had left that there as an offering at the cemetery, and on the handle there was a thumbprint. <gasps> And I had this moment where I just, I looked down and I'm, I'm totally dorking out because this is my first excavation yeah. and I didn't want to screw up, but it's magical and amazing. And I, I'm 20 years old, 21 years old. I can't believe I'm, I'm here living my dream. <laughs> and I see this thumbprint and there was this moment of like, I didn't know where I was. Um, almost like a, 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 a transcendent religious experience because I had this flash in my mind of the, of the person who made the pot, you right. know, this... I don't know, a, a larger gentleman that's a very thick thumbprint. And I had a vision of him uh, working in his potter's workshop at this village. You know, who did he make it for? How much did they pay for it? And it just, it blew my mind that like you could have these moments still separated right. by this gulf of time. Right. That's so you cool. can picture his shop. You can picture, um, there's a lovely bit in the videos for the uh, uh, Click Springs replication of the Antikythera mechanism where he said, he walks you down this path of how he builds this thing to replicate the one that's on the ship. But he says, there are several other ways you could have done this that are easier th than this. But this has a particular advantage. And he goes into the advantage and he goes, all this is a long way of saying, it's clear that this was built as part of a mature, it was a mature technology. This isn't the first one. It clearly came about because you could see that there's a history within this and the maker's mark potentially being the thumbprint, the idea that you go down to the shop to purchase this beer mug. I mean, wow. that's so thrilling. And, and the, uh, this idea that, you know, every, every, every potter, you know, they had their own particular way of making something. Yeah, okay, you have a thousand beer jars, but, you know, <laughs> you know Joe made his with, with a slightly thicker lip, which is great for when you're drinking. So I prefer to buy mine from him. Mm. Um, and it just, it, it, so often, you know, it's rare in antiquity that we get the names of the people who, right. whose pieces and, and things were excavating. So I think what it also taught me um, at a, at a very early age and an early part of my career was that ultimately, you know, our archaeologists are empathy machines. You know, we're, we're trying to connect people, not just us, but the people with whom we're communicating about our work to people in the past and kind of getting us to understand how little we've evolved and changed over time. That was something I found really striking. You did a TED Talk in 2016 about this, and I think that's where you guys met, right? And I remember Adam coming back saying how how great he was that he met you and i looked at the ted talk and the tech behind global explorer is super cool but the thing that resonated so much from your talk was like this very romantic nature of, about the idea of archaeology and that you're not looking for objects you're looking for people and there's something that's said about what they did thousands of years ago it's very similar to what we do now we're just kind of living our lives yeah, I think I think you know we we tend to fetishize the past. You know, be, you look at beautiful gold things in museums, and don't get me wrong, I get really excited when I find gold on sites. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the best part about what we do. You know, from thousands upon thousands of little potsherds, we can reconstruct their make and type and use, and are they from upper middle class or lower class? And and all of a sudden, you begin to paint this picture of what this society looked like at a particular time at a 
particular place. It's the closest I think we'll ever get, uh, at least for now, to a time machine. Um, and speaking of time machine, I, we haven't talked since uh, over Thanksgiving. My wife and I spent uh, a, a, the Thanksgiving holiday in Mexico City, and we went to the um, uh, uh, the Museum of Anthropology there. Right. Which holy hell! What a yeah, what a journey! What a trip! But uh, and. The gold stuff was interesting, but I found shocking the variety of pottery, of characters within the pottery, of figures and stuff. But the thing that blew me the most away were these tiny, fine obsidian shaving razors that there's this co like a pile of like eight of them. And the amount of handwork that had to have gone into making them really had that a similar empathetic effect on me of realizing the need was met by these, the need that was met by these and the craftsmanship that went into them felt so immediate. Yeah, I mean, so when, whenever I um, take a friend to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, in New York, um, my favorite thing to show them, because the question is, well, how did, you know, this great civilization and pyramids and amazing sculptures, where did it all begin? And I, I take them to the Neolithic case. So this is more than 7,000 years ago, and you look at these stunning, beautifully carved Neolithic flint blades, and there's something very mm. Egyptian about them, even many thousands of years before the pyramids, and it's wow. clear that they'd mastered stone, Right. and it was gorgeous. I'm like, all right, they're on their way to pyramids already. Wow. wow <laughs> you had a long Twitter thread the other day, helping people, helping walk people through the fact that the pyramids were not made by aliens. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Don't get me started. Do not get me started. And then oh. I think the very first tweet and response was, "It's aliens." Yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. Oh, Thirty God. years of internet, and that's yeah. what we can't. We've yeah. come to. Just yeah. do any of your colleagues ever go as that guy? The crazy, oh yeah, oh, yeah, the, the hair, yeah. yeah. ancient no, aliens guy. No, <laughs> like no. On, th on Halloween. No, I think I think if you if you say his name three times, <laughs> you show get up. sucked oh, into no. the Stargate. <laughs> 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 Hey everyone, before we continue with this week's episode, I want to let you know that support for Stolen Title also comes this week from WiseCam, an indoor live streaming camera that allows you to see everything from anywhere for only $20. A core value of Wise is providing quality tech at the lowest possible price. They're on a mission to democratize that tech and make amazing smart home products accessible to everyone, whether you're checking on your kids or if your 3D printer has finished printing, nothing is off limits for WiseCam thanks to its low profile design and friendly price point. It has a 1080p Wi-Fi camera, and it's packed with premium features like motion and sound alerts, two-way audio, and night vision, so you can see clearly after the sun goes down. And with WiseCam, you get full HD continuous video recording and 14 days of free rolling cloud storage. They don't compromise on quality or performance, plus there are zero subscription fees. It's easy to view playback of the WiseCam footage, and it works with Alexa. We have one set up in our nursery right now, so you can keep an eye on the baby overnight, in the middle of the night, during the day, when he's making noises, and even send whispers of love to him during the day, during his naps. Go to wise.com slash untitled to be guaranteed the lowest available price. That's wyze.com slash untitled for the lowest price price point on the wise cam now back to the show oh speaking of being sucked into a stargate i saw captain marvel yesterday oh wow we've you, all seen the movie seen yet? yes well and i saw yeah, it we the saw same the same time. oh do you yes. mind if we talk a little bit about no, I'm, I'm taking our son this weekend so oh. please spoiler so, free we're not gonna before, spoiler i have one more free. question before we jump yeah, over yeah, yeah. Can, um have you gone to, have, you, have you excavated places that were previously unexcavated and unspoiled for Thousands and oh, thousands yeah, of years. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've worked all over the world. So, so, I mean, I have to imagine that there's a, an amazing moment when you kind of first open up a tomb or, or a dwelling or whatever that's been, like I said, unspoiled for four, three, four thousand years. What, what does that what does that feel like? And and like what can you describe the sensations of just kind of going in yeah, there and for the and first like time? Like drinking the elixir. That's yeah. Yeah. The, the goo <laughs> from the bottom of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> when you say the Smelling code in the book and it yeah. unlocks for you, yeah, the, well, bi the biochemists always test everything, taste everything. So I assume that the archaeologists are the same yeah, we, way. We, we lick you lick every, the rocks, yeah. right? We, and, bones. And the bone, yeah, 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 we lick everything. That's, why, why that's, you, a, that's another conversation ex, ex, for another podcast, oh, clearly. Um, okay, but uh, uh, yeah, so so when we when yes, yeah, so when we're digging, so it, it's this, uh, it's so 
magical and and, and otherworldly because I, I sort of I have to fight right I'm a dorky scientist mm -hmm. I'm very grounded in years and years of method and theory and there's a, a there's a way to dig correctly mm -hmm. right and right. it's like it's like 12 science experiments are going on all at once and you really have to make sure that your work crews doing what they need to do and everything's being recorded because to dig is to destroy but then like it's insane because you're digging up things from thousands of years ago and whoever gets to do this and I wanted to do this ever since I was five and oh. I read National Geographic and I saw Indiana Jones for the first time so I'm like constantly tempering this inner five-year-old uh -huh. inside me um, and, and and because you never ever know what is going to come up and you could go for days and days and days and days and you know it's pretty standard you're uncovering things you have to have a lot of patience and then there's this moment where there's a flip on the site and there's, the ch there's a change in the energy and everyone comes running because a thing has been found <sighs> whatever that thing is it could be it could be something really tiny it could be a little amulet it could be something that you've missed um, because you send all your um, buckets of earth to be sieved and it's really easy to miss things uh -huh. uh, it could be that you know the thing you hope would be there wasn't so like uh, I, I work at a site um, about two hours south of Cairo called Lisht, and it was Egypt's uh, middle kingdom capital city called Ichtawi. It's an extraordinary site, and you have two pyramids there from Amenemhet I and Samhwasrit I, who are the founders of, of Dynasty Twelve, sort of the high point of, of Egypt's great renaissance period. And there are thousands upon thousands of tombs there um, from the people who lived and worked at, at Ichtawi. And the season that we were there, um, so this was 2015, we uh, were excavating. The tomb was partly looted, and then we came across a two-meter tall inscribed stela. Was this stela? So, so a false, so, so a false door. So, so okay. essentially, it was it was the autobiography of this individual written on this two meter tall, oh massive gosh. piece of limestone, weighed over a ton. It's the kind of thing you you typically see in a museum. Yeah. And we found it face down in one of the niches, wow. and it was like crap like <laughs> holy yeah. crap. that's not the word i use yeah. <laughs> and and it was so like we just we thought it had been looted or stolen and there it was lying down and we got uh, to put it back wow. in place oh. and translate it and it was just mind-blowing it's like the and then uh, james horner or hans zimmer score starts playing <laughs> and the camera pans up and it's the beginning of stargate <laughs> right and actually you know i have we have magical music on our iphones for yeah. these moments yeah. uh, <laughs> i'm so glad because that's exactly what norm would do if he was on a oh yeah oh yeah He'd start yeah. putting on the alan silvestri or uh, hans zimmer so what about film portrayals of archaeologists? I've obviously, you mentioned yeah. you know raiders, but like things like Stargate. What what are your favorites? Well, which or ones your... get it right? I guess. Yeah. Is the... so the, has anyone? So the only the only <laughs> the one mummy, right? that has ever come close to that moment of discovery in science and exploration is the English Patient. Oh, with the um, the the team that went out into the Western Desert to find the um, early inscriptions in the Cave of the Swimmers, mm -hmm. and that was based mm -hmm. off of uh, real explorers in the 20s and 30s who did that. The cave in which she dies. Yeah. Ah, oh, spoiler. But, but no one's no one's gotten it right yet. Wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. wow. Not na not even <laughs> not even National Treasure. I couldn't say it with a straight face. <laughs> I, I was going to ask about the mummy, Adam. So you know. What I. When I visited uh, the archives where the uh, Declaration of Independence sits, I, I said to the I said to the security guard, "So does this really drop down the shaft and get put in?" <laughs> I, I worked I worked in Bre with Brendan Fraser on something um, about five or six years ago, and at one point he turned to me and he just said, "I'm so sorry about the mummy." Oh. <laughs> so sorry. I'm like, "No, it was great. It's great. You made a librarian a heroine. Like my field loves you." That's so, true. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I said one more. Archaeology question, then, I'll, then we can talk about the. I got one more the, too. Okay. <laughs> what did what did what did tombs smell like? Oh yeah. Um, so it depends. Okay. So um, uh, tombs are places where bats like to live. Oh. And I so know well. this very heavy, uh, fusty, um, dank basement full of wine that you probably don't want to drink, dusty, mm. um, sometimes slightly of pee. 
Okay. <laughs> nice. did, did you, did you, are they sneezy places? Are they places you get in and sneeze not, a lot? Not, or not really. Not sneezy. I mean, so so. Um, I generally have my team and my workmen as well. i um, always wear masks. Oh, okay. Because the dust particulates are really fine, and if there's any guano, you don't want to be inhaling that. Right. So. Um, but yeah, tombs that have been excavated can just smell very heavy. Like I, if 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 you were to spritz some Egyptian tomb in the room, I would know it. Wow. Oh, wow. Essence like of tomb. And Wet basement and dust. And I'm right there. There's, there's never any snakes. Well, so <laughs> I have had many <laughs> encounters with snakes. Really? Yes. How do you feel about snakes? Are you pro or con? <laughs> I mean, I, so I, I am. So so typically, um, so snakes don't like humans yeah. that's, uh, at all. And so we always trump really heavily, mm-hmm. which tends yeah. to scare them away. But we, I, we worked for a couple of years along the west coast of Sinai and they have um, uh, horn and pit vipers. And if they Ooh. bite you, you have about two or three minutes. Oh boy. Um, so we had to be really, really careful. And because the tents where we were working were places oh. of shade, they like to hang out oh. in and around our tent. And there were a couple times that they were there. Um, we had our workmen dispose of them and okay. we felt terrible because it's not their fault that they're just looking for a cool place to hang out. Yeah. But yeah, they're, they're not nice to, if they bite you. So you mentioned those face syringes they have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's they're, they're really scary looking. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Met. Adam, you mentioned the Museum of Mexico City. A lot of the work you do, I assume some of that stuff excavated goes to museums. Do you think about like what is your ideal way that stuff is presented to the public and how people experience the kind of research that you do right so um every country has its own um, rules and regulations so in egypt um, we work with the permission of the ministry of antiquities and uh everything that we excavate is photographed and documented and cataloged and goes to um, regional storehouses but say we find something really spectacular a beautiful statue or mummy um, that has the chance of being exhibited in a museum it's up to the ministry um, you know, I there are a lot of discussions and debates being had right now, I think, and, and rightfully so, about a repatriation mm-hmm. of objects. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at the, say, the Benin Bronzes uh, in, in, in France, and I say, I, I believe if there's, there are living cultures that have connections to these objects and they were looted or stolen, I think we have to return them. Um, but I think the time has come for us to have a lot of uncomfortable discussions about ownership and, and representation and, you know, look at what we can do with 3D printing now. Why aren't we yeah. using that more? I, I also noticed like there's a lot of debate. Uh, there's a I think the U.S. has more policies in place about Native American artifacts, right. and there's been some interesting difficulties in the intersection of what are considered to be plausibly pre-Native American artifacts, and I I think that the Native American community feels rightfully like they don't necessarily have a reason to trust. Uh, to trust the U.S. for saying, oh, no, no, these are pre and these aren't you guys and we need to. And really what this is about is, is a dance of knowledge to, to work together with knowledge. But of course, the, you, the, the indigenous community of America has no reason to trust to trust our government in anything it says about how it's dealing with these antiquities. And I understand that lack of trust, but I also understand the need to figure out, you know, where we've been and what we've done. Right, you know, and so so using Egypt for, as as an example, aside from things like the you know the bust of Nefertiti, um, which is in Berlin, which the Egyptians want back, and and say the um, uh, any one of a number of, of famous objects like the Rosetta Stone, which was used to help decipher Egyptian over two hundred years ago in the British Museum. I mean, there are millions of scarabs. And there are many, many, many thousands of mummies. So should everything be returned to Egypt? Or should people who say maybe wouldn't get the chance to go to Egypt, um, should they be able to appreciate them? Look at people who maybe um, would have trouble traveling there, who are mm-hmm, disabled. Mm-hmm. What about people who don't have money? Um, you know, there's some give and take on both sides. And I just think we need to be more honest about what should be out there and what shouldn't. Mm-hmm. You also ended your talk, TED Talk about this kind of urgency that a lot of these sites are being pillaged and destroyed. And so two years later, what is the, the status of that? And so, yeah, so, I mean, looting, looting hasn't stopped anywhere. You know, even with the, the recent government shutdown in the U.S., um, there were posts within 36, 48 hours of, um, of uh, on online platforms by anonymous individuals, but basically people calling for Civil War battlefields to be looted because they weren't being guarded yeah. oh anymore. So, like, 
oftentimes we're trash and you know <laughs> what what can we do and in these cases it's not just a problem in Egypt or Peru or it, it's everywhere um, so I, I think what, what I'm hoping to do with Global Explorer and with my organization is just raise awareness and teach people you know that they can it's better to own a piece of the story than to own an object mm. and this isn't a problem that's going to go away in a week or a month did you know did you know that King Tut's tomb was actually looted yes like really yeah. yeah it was looted so everyone thinks it was intact right but um when howard carter and his team um excavated it they found that the unguent jars which had held the equivalent of ancient creams and perfumes they found handprint marks <gasps> so if the looting if the, if the party that had buried him had taken you know gold and jewelry with Tut's name on it they would have been in trouble but they could take the unguents because no one would know oh my gosh so like this isn't something that's new this has been going right, on right. for thousands of I years mean, the the big pyramids were all looted what in like the, the, before the birth of Christ presumably oh you know they, they were probably looted in part by the burial parties yeah. and then long mm-hmm. since looted and yeah. am I correct it is a myth that Napoleon's men shot off the nose of the Sphinx yeah that that is that is a myth it happened well before um, his, his Caesar's time. myth <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. So, so the other the other crazy thing to, to think is is where we are in we are closer in time to Cleopatra than Cleopatra was to the time of the Great Pyramids. Wow! Yeah. Wow! What? So, yeah, it's sort of mind blowing wow. when you think about this our perceptions of time right, and place right. and how that changes. Yeah, there's a story that came up. I'm still trying to find it. I should have just written to you, but um, about a paint mixing cave in Africa. That was being they that mostly they made ochre, but they found evidence of other colors in the strata as they went through it, and they it, it existed something like tw- more than fifteen thousand years ago, for like three thousand years it was used as this paint mixing cave. Sherwin and, Williams. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, that is a mind blowing thing to think of a culture so stable. This cave had the same occupation for you know longer than recorded civilization or recorded western civilization it was rent control (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh it's so like it's so i love reading about ancient history because one of the things i feel like is if i was suddenly zapped to a roman market two thousand years ago the thing that would surprise me the most is how unsurprising it would be how much i would feel familiarly like i'm in a city yeah, I mean, yeah, walking around a site like Pompeii, it's just like walking around the old part of any any European city. And, right. you know, you sort of imagine the tavernas and the drunken, rowdy people. And There's a restaurant. There's a hotel. There's right. a dwelling. There's the brothels. There's right? the brothels. <laughs> yep. I, I like to point out to people that there's uh, graffiti on one of the walls in Pompeii that complains about this generation of kids having n- no level of respect or stick to And I was like, that's a... A thing to log. Yeah, Every generation else. complains about well, the in, previous. From, from in, in ancient Egypt, um, uh, the, there was a there's a, a quote from the New Kingdom, so three thousand eight hundred years ago, saying um, a boy's ears are upon his back. In other words, boys will only listen if you beat them. Wow! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Spare the rod. Uh, yes. Um, uh, before we go, talk about. Captain Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> um, in case sometimes people b- bail out when we start talking about movies they haven't seen yet. So, yep. where can people find out more about you and Open Explorer, or Sarah? So, um, so if they go to uh, globalexplorer.org, so that's global and then X as an X marks the spot, okay. explorer.org. I also have a, a book coming out this summer, Shameless Self Promotion um, Ar- Arche- Archaeology from Space How the Future Shapes Our Past. So, it's the story of space archaeology and, and my grand vision for how um, the past should help help us think about our future existence on this rock. She sent me an advanced reader copy. I've just cracked it uh, a couple of days ago and it's delightful. Thank it's you. just like, it's just, reading it is very similar to hanging out with you. <laughs> it's just as infectious well, and thrilling you. and fun. Very cool. Okay, so now, now <laughs> the space movie. <laughs> to popular culture, yeah, everyone. Spoiler free. Uh, this is not. This is spoiler free. Spoiler yes, free? we are okay. gonna. Let's not... talk spoiler free. We'll talk spoiler full because I'd like to. I want to go see it again. Yes, I liked it. I, I would, would do that. I will just say I liked it so much that we immediately came home and watched Guardians of the Galaxy to spend more it's... more time in that loving Marvel. It, well, it's funny because that that to me it took me a while to get there, but when we left, I couldn't figure out where I 
slotted it, and it's very much in the Guardians of the Galaxy vein. Yes. Right? Like, it's it's telling a mostly standalone story that's kind of tangentially tied in, if you care, to the larger MCU storyline. But it's just a really nice character story about about this person who has extraordinary things happen to her. Yeah. and um, It's funny. And it's funny. That's all I want to say. It's hilarious. Really funny. Um, I really, I just loved it. I, I found it absolutely terrific, really thrilling. I loved Brie Larson. I loved that they didn't give her a romantic interest or anything like that. Yeah. Like, just a good story about a superhero. And the costuming is very good. Like, the, there's probably four super suits throughout that throughout that thing. They're variations of the same thing, mm-hmm. and they're all very good. But the one with the mohawk is just fire. Dude, the mohawk that was my wife's favorite. Yeah. One favorite iteration. Like people of cheered the suit. in the theater when the Mohawk suit came out for us. The Mohawk suit was fabulous, and I loved. Um, oh my God, Annette Benning. Annette yeah. Benning plays a significant role in this, and she's great. So does Lee Pace. He shows back up as Ronan. Yes. Um, from Guardians, I didn't realize I was bracketing Ronan in the MCU by watching Guardians last night. I, well, I, we started the movie, and I was like, because it starts with "Hey, Cree Homeworld," yada yada. I was like, hold on. Wait a second. <laughs> These are the bad people from Fantastic Four. I know Cree. Um, and, and then it becomes clear as the movie progresses. But but yeah. It, I don't want to say anything more. Yeah, no. You know, it's, they're, they're, we'll go into spoilers. We will yes. go into spoilers. Okay, so we'll park... We'll park this right now, but Captain Marvel is terrific, and I, I probably it'll be a couple of weeks before we revisit yeah, with yeah. a spoiler cast. I want to watch it again before we do a spoiler cast. You and me both. I also want to give a recommendation uh, to the Apollo Eleven documentary. Oh, I was good, able to see good, that good. in IMAX, and it is like this is what I wish I got to see when I was in middle school or high school. I would spend hours like watching just this kind of footage. There's no narration; it is just oh, wow. audio from. Uh, just audio and, and film audio and film from the past um, how, how long is it it's hour and a half and uh there's uh, just very few i'm just giving i don't I mean, there are no spoilers but the way it's presented i want to spoil Wait, the way they it's presented but is it is it is it appropriate for for nerdy kids yes i was gonna say it is, you, you it is. told me probably my daughter who's six is maybe a little young and might be bored because there's some slow parts like they draw out the how like how they tried to build up the tension and they do convey the t- the tension of landing in the sea of oh. tranquility way more even than first man did you know first man had the yeah. in the moment but they do it in an intellectual level um when from first, so they the, lay the groundwork for how complicated yes. and how wow and, and first, all that first is man really doesn't appreciated get into the like they had three seconds left when when they finally when he finally finally touched yeah. down in the hole yeah. both that like and also the return home the table, yeah right? so uh, the only thing i'll say it is it starts off like three hours before launch as they're suiting up and it's a linear story uh, with some parts sped up to when they return. Oh, and is it in like both in cockpit, you know, in the capsule and it in is mission all control, the, footage, the whole thing? as much footage as they filmed okay. in the cockpit. They had two cameras, their film cameras, the broadcast cameras, they were put side by side. And so it, it, oh, wow. it's really nice. Did, did you really see nice it in uh, IMAX? Yeah, it's, okay. it's worth it. Okay. Had the Metreon? Uh, when I was in LA. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, got to see that. I'm super, super excited about that. Um, there's so much to go over, but I can't tell you about any of it because I've just had a couple of mind-blowing weeks of filming the new show. And uh, again, an announcement about what it's named and when it's going to air is going to happen very soon, but I still can't reveal any details. Um, yeah, that's most of what... That's, <laughs> that's most of the cool non-information story, yeah. I have. No, nice work. Really nailed that one. Hey, you're welcome, everybody. <laughs> Keep the tease alive. Um, I watched all of Umbrella Academy on Netflix last week. I watched the first episode, and I had no desire to watch the second it's, one. It, it, but The second episode is where it gets okay. where it picks up. All right. Um, I think that they do a grave disservice to that show by making the marketing about the big guy in the space suit when that's literally like the first 30 seconds of the TV show and that's it. Fascinating. Yeah. Like all of their thumbnail images and stuff are, are Are that guy, that guy in the space suit. And it's just like, it's, it's a really, it's like, I I thought I was blown away by it. I thought it was really lovely. I thought that Ellen page was amazing. And I thought the guy that played the drug addicted son was um, enraged me. I was so tired of his scenery chewing in the first episode. I felt what I felt like was scenery chewing. I, 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 if you tell me this, it earns the whole thing. Okay. I think, I think um, it sticks the landing better than any, any comic book thing I've seen in a long time. Then totally willing to go back. It's really good. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you so much, Sarah. Yeah, thank Sarah, thank you. what a pleasure to have you visit awesome. the cave. And I, there's still some photos I think you've got to take before you go. 
<laughs> well, well, I'm, well, I'm supposed to leave. Oh you, no, no, no! You can put on you can stay as long want. as you want. <laughs> yeah, not only can you take pictures of everything, but if you want to wear anything, it's uh, <gasps> at your disposal. Oh my yeah. gosh! The metal C-3PO head, though, I wouldn't recommend. It's a it's really it's scary. An actual in there. Iron Maiden. It's, it's... <laughs> it's the only time I've ever been claustrophobic is putting on the all brass C-3PO. Yeah, it's scary. We have that on video. <laughs> oh, really? Do we? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> uh, see you all next week, Norm. Anything on the site this week? Yeah. Anything exciting? Uh, Do you I, know I what have, day it is? I have a child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I have a four-month-old. Okay. But there's some good stuff. Okay. Yes. Good. Good. Yes. See you all next week. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening this week. And once again, Still Entitled is made possible by WiseCam. Wise is on a mission to make amazing smart home products accessible. To everyone. The Wise indoor camera is packed with premium features that allow you to see anything from anywhere for only $20. Whether you're checking to see if your kids are home safe or if your 3D printer has finished printing, nothing is off limits for your Wise Cam setup. Go to wise.com slash untitled. That's W-Y-Z-E dot com slash untitled to be guaranteed the lowest available price. We'll see you next week.